Ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you please find your seats. Our presentation is about to begin. Please find your seats. Welcome to each of you in the audience, and thank you so much for being here for the event to hear from Larry Culp, Jean Woods, moderated by Mary, Mary Beth and her Torbett, thank you, Hayes, that they will examine the topic of radical collaboration, a calling together to engage, explore, experiment, and enlighten. Good evening, my name is Sue Henderson. I'm the Executive Director of Wake Forest University Space to Face Speaker Forum, and I am elated to be with you this evening as we celebrate the inauguration of Dr. Susan R. Wente. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Face to Face, our role is to bring world-class speakers to Winston-Salem on an annual basis. Face to Face events cover a variety of topics to include political affairs, business and innovation, social justice, global issues, and arts and culture. We were profoundly humbled when we found out that Face to Face had been selected to be a part of Dr. Wente's inauguration by hosting tonight's event. Tonight is such an honor for Face to Face, and we deeply appreciate Dr. Wente and the inauguration steering committee for inviting us to be here. I want to extend a special thank you to the dignitaries who are here from peer institutions, along with the many community leaders, students, faculty, staff, special guests, Dr. Wente's family, and Board of Trustees. And of course, the face-to-face -face Board of Advisors, Keynote Society members, and our sponsors. While the influence of face-to-face -face is far-reaching, perhaps the greatest impact is on Wake Forest students. We are pleased that so many students came to our student-only events here on campus. I want to take a moment to offer our deepest gratitude to the wonderful and very generous sponsors that make Face to Face possible. You can see our sponsors in your program. Now it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce the 14th president of Wake Forest University, President Susan R. Wente. Give a round of applause. course of her career, Dr. Wente's brand of leadership has not only guided organizations and institutions, she has represent, represented to new ground. She has done so while embracing a spirit of collaboration and inclusion that empowers those around her. 
It's a virtue and a philosophy that made her a Wake Forester before she arrived on campus. And the following video will touch upon our shared commitment to the idea of radical collaboration. Again, congratulations, Dr. Wente. We see it on a cellular level, in every living tissue and organism, and in every healthy family and thriving community. Collaboration is everywhere. I think it creates this incredible uh, richness and aliveness and openness. That is why I chose this profession. That is why I stay in this profession. For me, it made me a, a better teacher for the class. That's what collaboration is, is it, is it activates you. Here at Wake Forest, Radical collaboration unleashes a transformative power in education through the confluence of open minds. It's the belief that a diversity of people and perspectives can lead us into unknown territory. That what we can create and experience, where we can lead, and what we can solve together is only limited by the boundaries of our imagination and our willingness to collaborate. I am able to bring my expertise as a historian to this, to this group of engineers without necessarily knowing very much about engineering. And the engineering professors and students are able to bring their discipline-specific knowledge of engineering to a space where we're investigating shared questions. The collaboration, it feels at times like an improvisational jazz band where each person's kind of bringing their history of doing something and then at times we're just like riffing off of each other, responding. You see things in a different way, it clarifies it. It's improvising, responding to each other, but also responding to the students and responding to the world, all sort of in real time. These collaborations allow you to see the world through fresh eyes. You can do, have a lot more reach in what you do by collaborating with others. Radical collaboration is a calling together to engage, explore, experiment, and enlighten. It is found in our classrooms, on the quad, in our laboratories, on stages, in studios, residence halls, and even abroad, because inspiration and solutions find each other everywhere. What radical collaboration does is that it sort of mixes the foundations of our disciplines. The sort of fun and the joy of collaboration comes out of finding those shared questions and then appreciating the different ways that, that people are, are approaching them from their disciplinary knowledge. I think one thing that's special about Wake Forest is the way that it can create spaces for collaboration. And people have been really interested in how they can help me remove the barriers to make the vision that I have possible. Wake Forest really is like an ideal place for this type of work. And I, don't, I couldn't imagine myself being anywhere else because this is a place where psychologists, philosophers, people from different disciplines can come together. Anybody can be informed about something, but to be an expert in something requires an immense amount of study. Like we spend our lives doing that. And so when you get the chance to work with people in other disciplines, you're adding tools to your toolbox. I can learn all I want about law, but I'm still not going to approach the problem like a lawyer. Yep. So you, you have to have those collaborations. One of the great things for me about being on this faculty is being able to have those interactions. You can't replicate within your own discipline. You have to be able to get it from outside. At the heart of the Wake Forest experience will forever lie a passion for intellectual curiosity, a purpose in our deeds, and a mission to achieve together what we could never do alone for humanity. such a pleasure to be with you all here tonight and on the eve of inauguration. I can't imagine being anywhere else but right here for face-to-face. -face. I'm thrilled to welcome you to campus 
and to this very special evening event. And that was an amazing video. I've only seen little snippets of it. It was great to see it all put together. And I want to thank our Wake Forest communications team for creating such a terrific showcase of what it means to be radical collaborators on this campus. Thank you. Since the start of my presidency last July, I've spoken to many different groups about radical collaboration and how we can embrace this even further in terms of how we work together. I think about radical collaboration on many levels, and you saw some of those levels in that video. For example, myself as a biologist, I've spent decades uh, studying life on a cellular level. My research lab explored how normal cells work as well as how their functions can be altered. Now, cells are made up of constituent parts called organelles, and each of these has a distinct structure and function. In order for a cell to function properly, the organelles need to all work together. In addition, each cell must be linked to another cell and coordinate that work together to make it possible for tissues and organs and the entire body to function. Thus, this intentional collaboration which I saw so closely within cells and between cells is incredibly meaningful to me tonight. I would say that what I've seen under the microscope is also true within universities, businesses, and community groups. In fact, such collaboration is fundamental to any innovation, any partnership, any thriving human activity. That's why we must continually seek diverse viewpoints, listen to one another, and build partnerships across all parts of society. So to learn more about how we can drive radical collaboration, tonight we're going to hear from two people who have pioneered innovation and partnership in the world of business, from the boardroom to the boiler room, so to say. First, we're going to hear from Larry Culp. Larry is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of General Electric. In his role, he has led the company's transformation into a simpler, stronger, high-tech industrial company. Prior to joining GE, Culp served as the President and CEO of Danaher Corporation from 2000 to 2014. Investors and analysts consistently rank him as one of the top CEOs, and Harvard Business Review named Culp one of the top 50 CEOs in the world. The father of three Wake Foresters, he also proudly serves on our Board of Trustees. Now joining Larry Culp is Gene Woods, President and Chief Executive Officer of Atrium Health. Atrium Health is one of the largest nonprofit and leading academic health systems in the United States. In his role, Wood leads over 70,000 teammates who serve patients at 40 hospitals and more than 1,400 care locations across five states, including our very own radical collaboration and partnership between Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist, and Wake Forest University. And in December, Woods was honored by Modern Healthcare as one of the most influential people in healthcare today, number four out of 100. <laughs> Moderating Culp and Woods' conversation is Mary Beth Torbett Hayes, who has held a variety of senior roles at top companies, including Walmart, Sam's Club, Lowe's Home Improvement, and Haynes Brands. Hayes, a double deacon, proudly serves on our Board of Trustees. Please join me in welcoming them. Settled in. Thank you so much, Dr. Winty. Wow. Thank you all for joining us, and gentlemen. Um, as I told you backstage, <clears throat> I 
and I promise you this is the truth. We're going to start with some rapid fire questions and they don't know what they are. Okay, so a little bit of Jimmy Fallon here just to get us relaxed and, and loose. Who wants to go first? Gene. Okay, uh, Gene. <laughs> I love it. This is the rock, paper, scissors thing. <laughs> I love it. This is fun. Okay. <clears throat> Ready? Just answer, you know, what comes first. Ready? Okay. I need to be quick. So, music. <laughs> Classical or classic rock? Uh, classic rock. Okay. And I know you're a guitar player. So yeah. Fender or Gibson? Fender for sure. Fender, all right. Yeah. Very good. No doubt. <laughs> That's my husband. Yeah. That, <laughs> um, Barcelona or Madrid? I'm sorry? Barcelona or Madrid? Uh, uh, Barcelona. Okay. Yeah. All right. Barcelona. Have you ever been truly starstruck? And if so, from whom? Starstruck. Um, I think. Let me. Th uh, let me think about that. I, I, probably um, somebody that people won't know is John Schofield, is a jazz guitar player. I got a chance to speak uh, backstage to once. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Yes or no? Sing in the shower. Yes. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I sound really good in the shower. <laughs> Your favorite musical group or artist of all time? A favorite, Stevie Wonder, for sure. Oh, all right, Stevie Wonder, excellent. So are you a one episode at a time kind of guy, or do you like to binge watch? Uh, for sure, one episode. One episode, yeah, very yeah. good. Pet peeve. Pet peeve, uh, whining. <laughs> Say again. People that whine. Whiners, <laughs> whiners. <laughs> um, no, for those of us who've worked in more the Brit culture, they call it whinging. Whinging. The whinging, okay, right? Whinging. Um, what was your favorite subject in school growing up? Uh, philosophy. Philosophy. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Last one. See, yeah. you've done. See, you survived survive. your unscathed. Yeah. Okay. Best leadership advice you've ever heard or received? Um, I think. It, you know, the, the quote I've always gravitated to is uh, character as a person is not in comfort or convenience it's times in challenge and controversy which is Martin Luther King and so that's, that's been something that's always kind of guided me yeah. very good thank you so much alright Larry it's your turn you're on the hot seat ready same question and, and no no <laughs> I, I don't want him copying off of my answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, nope. and I was holding the, you know, the pad like away okay. from you down there. So Larry, he did not get an unfair advantage. Okay, not the same questions except the last one. Okay, Yankees or Red Sox? Red Sox Nation. Come on. Yeah. No. <laughs> right, that was a huge softball or baseball. Okay, um, fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. All right. Duck hunting or fishing? Fishing. All right, very good. Now here's the dreaded question. Dinner with one famous person, living or dead, you would pick? Thomas Jefferson. Oh, okay, very good. All right, yes or no? Are you an emoji fan when texting? What's an emoji? An emo oh. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I can load you up with them. So. <laughs> okay, easy one. Favorite color? Blue. Most men say blue, statistically. I used to be in apparel, so it's kind of a thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> night out or night in? Which one do you usually prefer? Night in. Night in, okay. What's a food that you hate? Sardines. Okay. <laughs> Me too. Here's, here's a fun one, very current. Gold or crypto? Gold. There you go. And your best leadership advice ever? You Trust your gut. Say again? Trust your Trust gut. Trust your gut. Very good. Very good. I like it. I like it. Well, my gut's telling me we're going to have a great, uh, great conversation tonight now that we're all like loosened up. 
but we're here tonight because you've both just had extraordinary um, careers in healthcare and industrials, respectively. So I, I know the audience would appreciate knowing a little bit about your path, how you got there, maybe what, what drew you to the career field. And um, Jean, I'm gonna start with you because I think it, there may have been a little bit of fate in there or I've heard there could have been a schedule mix up. So why don't you like, tell us how on earth you got into healthcare? You, you do your research well. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I was actually ended up, it was always known that I was gonna be the first in my family to go to college. I just wasn't quite sure what that was gonna be, but it was an expectation that was set by the family. And, uh, you know, I've got friends that wanted to be doctors, others that want to be lawyers. I had no idea what I wanted to be. So I went into uh, Penn State University and, um, and I really sort of undefined, uh, I mentioned philosophy, I took some mm -hmm. philosophy courses, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And it was about time to declare something. And I had a conversation with one of my favorite professors and I said, I really don't know what I want to do. Um, so can you help me think through this? So he said, well, you speak Spanish fluently. Um, my mother's from southern Spain, and so I've got lots of family there. And tell me a little bit about your family. Well, they're entrepreneurs and, and, and things of that nature. So, so we get through this, and he says, you know, you're in luck because there's a, a business uh, career day that also has an international connection to it. So I said, perfect. So I went on Tuesday, and uh, as I was listening, sitting there, it was nothing to do about business, and I had confused the days. I should have gone Wednesday, and it was Tuesday. And so it was the local hospital administrator saying, healthcare is too much of the GDP. We need young, bright minds to really mm -hmm. come into the field. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then also the, the, the privilege of it is in this role, because nobody, nobody grows up saying, I want to be a hospital administrator. Nobody knows what it is um, at that time. But it, the privilege of really using this position to impact lives and communities. And literally, he had me at hello and at the end of that uh, little career fair, I went and signed up for health planning administration. So that was the, you know, they say there's no accidents in the universe. Uh, so right. I think I'm, I'm, I feel blessed that that was the accident that happened to me. So, so, yeah. Okay, I, I like that. And, and Larry, I've heard that um, maybe you had an affinity for industrials because of um, your family's multi-generation welding shop. So did, did that have a part in your attraction in industrials or did you show up on the wrong day to <laughs> career fair? How did it happen? Uh, indeed, your research is impeccable. <laughs> but uh, my grandfather, who was from North Carolina, founded a small welding business in 1938 in Washington, D.C. And it was a company that my father, actually both my parents, ran. So really throughout my uh, junior high, high school years, I had exposure to a small business, emphasis on small, but was always intrigued by business. When I, went, uh, when I came out of college, I went into consulting, which I loved, but as the audience who consults or has consulted will know, you serve, but you don't really compete. And I love to compete. So when I went to business school, I knew it would be a transition. And in the late 80s, conventional wisdom was, the Japanese and the Germans are going to overtake American industry. So being somewhat of a contrarian, I thought I would go into a field that was fading and ended up having 25 years with a great American manufacturer called Danaher. Fantastic, fantastic. That's great. Okay, competition, we're gonna come back to that. Um, Dr. Wente's uh, leadership theme for her presidency, which really is, a, She's the CEO of, of Wake Forest, right? Yeah. It's radical or deliberate collaboration. And when Susan and I were speaking last week, she explained it about, um, it means it's a partnership between groups that may not naturally come together. And I, I love this, this quote. It's about enabling the best for each other, okay? So I, I pulled up some examples in the marketplace uh, today. Uh, there's Starbucks and Spotify that I'll admit I did not know about, but recognizing the untapped potential of combining a restaurant app, which we've all used, with a member or user experience in store, 
Um, Starbucks customers can go into the app and create a Spotify playlist and enjoy it in the store, hopefully wearing earbuds. Mm -hmm. um, but they can also enjoy it you know, as they leave the store with their lattes later. So it's not, it's not space to find. Um, North Face and Gucci, there's one, right? You've got an outdoor brand and a you know, high-level designer brand sort of defying you know, the idea that beauty and functionality can't coexist, okay? It's apparently doing well. And just today, Uber um, announced that um, it will add New York City taxi cabs into the Uber app, right? So this is an industry they sort of set out to disrupt and now they're collaborating and more cities are, are coming. Their stock, stock jumped 4% on the news um, today. And then let's come closer into our mission of education. Uh, we have a great example of Carolina's based, it's Red Ventures, and I know Gene, you're very familiar um, with the company and the CEO, um, Rick Elias, I believe you're friends. And uh, one part of a much larger initiative that they have um, is a partnership with HBCU Johnson C. Smith University where um, graduating seniors who have completed a year-long course with a grade of B or higher have a guaranteed job with Red Venture. And you had said it's part of a much larger you know, initiative, initiative that right. they have, but yeah. you know, truly innovative stuff. Um, these are all great examples, but as I was doing my research, I was, I was a little taken aback at actually how hard it was to come up with some of these examples. I'm throwing lines out to friends, I'm trying to crowdsource um, some good examples. And then we heard in the opening video about the joy of collaboration and, and you know, that resonated with both of us. So can you, can you talk to us a little bit about why you feel like collaboration at this point in time, it's so important now, right? Why is it so hard, right? So tell us a bit, this is the real meat of our discussion today. We wanna to learn from your experiences, tell us the stories of, um, of your collaborations. So I do know that um, I've heard a lot about uh, Larry, your management uh, mission as, G, as you knew, uh, CEO of GE was described to me as, quote, silo busting <laughs> okay, and about inverting the organizational pyramid. So I can think of a few companies with a more ingrained or storied culture than GE. You're the first um, GE CEO who did not grow up within the company, mm -hmm. and you're all about change and radical collaboration. So can you take us through what you're up to and how are you driving that change? Well, I think you hit on probably the two critical dimensions of how we're trying to transform GE, and it really does, I think, play to this theme of radical collaboration. GE operates at scale, has for 130 years, right? It truly is one of the country's remarkable businesses. But over time, one of the things that we did, and I don't know how deliberate or accidental it was, is we developed extremely strong functions. You pick the function, some of the best practitioners in the world worked or work at GE today. However, I think in a number of instances that became an overdeveloped muscle. So we ended up having strong functions, mm -hmm. but not necessarily integration or collaboration across the functions. And there's a good bit that we're doing to really drive that because these functional superstars are terrific, but when they come together, that's when the magic really happens. And when you talk about inverting the, the, the pyramid, we don't necessarily use that term at GE, but a good bit of how we're going about running the business today is really geared toward the folks that touch customers every day, as opposed to those of us who live in the boardroom. And that's not always the way corporate America works, but if you're a second shift welder, if you're a salesperson, trying to take care of Gene and the Atrium team, if you're someone in a lab developing a new technology, you're doing the real work at GE. And tr trying to rewire and replumb the organization so we're hyper-focused on making sure those people are at their best really does require a different form of radical collaboration. And we don't get that right every day, but when we do, it's pretty special as well. Okay, 
Fantastic. Now, I have um, a follow -up, quick follow-up question on that. Um, I've often said that people are going to do what you ask them to do, mm -hmm. right? So on their, you know, evaluations or their goals and metrics, have you right. had to go in and basically, you know, re-engineer that cross-functionally? Are you at we, that point yet? We've re-engineered the way we work right? more so than the way we might evaluate an individual or a team. Okay. So there's a, I don't know how much of that you want to get into, but we could get into the bowels of how we actually are re-engineering the way our senior teams operate. We use a, t a, a, a tool that we borrow from the Japanese called Hushin Kanri, okay. which we'll get into later perhaps. <laughs> and lower in the organization, we use Kaizen, right? This very deliberate process by which we drive process improvements with team members regardless of function, frankly, regardless of seniority. So if we get that right at the senior level in each of our businesses and we get it right day in, day out, where, where the real work gets done, mm -hmm. a lot of what you're asking about in terms of what we evaluate and how we perform, it actually takes care of itself. Because you, you can't tell people, collaborate. Right. Right? You really need to change the way that we work. And those two tools really help us do that, if you will, at the top and throughout the organization. I would love to hear more about okay. those tools. So we might, um, might come back to that. Okay. Um, and I've heard about Kaizen, and um, I'll probably embarrass Larry by telling you that um, I've heard many stories as I was doing my research about um, you love nothing more than like getting out on a shop floor and um, relaying out process and, and saving steps from like 25,000 steps down to 186 you know, steps for a certain product. So you're, um, you're still, still in the machine shop, I think, um, and applying all that, all that background, which is fantastic. So, okay, Gene, to you now. So you engineered, helped engineer the collaboration between Wake Forest and Atrium Health. Oh. And um, that'll bring uh, the presence of a major medical school to my hometown, to Charlotte, so, um, so thank you. Um, but let me put you on the spot, could you, give some behind the scenes. I mean, thinking about the scope of that, you've got geography, you've got you know, different organizations with you know, possibly different goals. How did it happen? The motivation, the idea, how did, how did you get it across the line? When did it start? Yeah, well, I think, um, I, so next month is gonna be my six years with, with Atrium. <clears throat> and um, when I first arrived, the, the board asked me the question you thought they should be asking the CEO is, look 10 years out and what do we need to address now? What do we need to solve now? What do we need to, uh, seeds that we need to plant now to be the leading health system in the country? And we, we went through a lot of conversation, but there was a key, key a couple key components. One is there was a workforce shortage there for, for doctors, for nurses back then, and, and now with, we know all the labor issues. We've talked a little bit about Indeed. that that exists across sectors. And so one of the conversations was we, we're really going to need to continue to grow our own going forward, and we really need to think about our how we learn, how we educate. Um, that was one piece. The other part was, hey, we want to be the type of organization that if you're in California or Boston or wherever, you want to come here because you feel like this is where you can get the best care anywhere. Mm. And that part of that conversation was, uh, we have to really embed research into our clinical specialties in new ways uh, so that the latest science gets in the, the hands of our clinicians fast. And then it's this concept of innovation which is, a, I love the, the discussion about a jazz sort of approach to that, because uh, that really describes it. And, and we really needed to, you know, healthcare can't be done the way that it's always been done. So we really needed to revamp our business models, our technology models, and things of that nature. So I, uh, my comment to the board at the time was we really need to rethink, uh, you know, we're in AI and, and all that. We really need to rethink how we innovate. Um, and I was sharing with Larry backstage, um, you know, my sons are computer engineers. My, my oldest son works at, at, in, the, in the virtual reality section of Facebook. Um, 
And so, you know, and I was sharing that we play every Sunday, we're playing with these Oculus glasses, you, you know, uh, we're playing golf or we're shooting zombies or something. And that <laughs> technology really is going to transform the way that we do care. Right. And so as we, we're looking at that, um, I, I share with the board to get to where we need to be, I think we need the right academic partner that has these components. And so mm -hmm. we had a number of conversations and that led me to, to to a dinner, which I remember very well with Dr. Julie Freischlag. And we were talking about what does the future look like? What do you think the future looks like? Uh, how do we get there? And literally, if she's here, she knows that by the end of the dinner, we were sort of finishing each other's sentences mm. in terms of how we viewed mm. the, the future. And so that led to, um, we empowered, I think, four or five different groups, clinical groups, and said, let's go see where the possibilities might be. And then let's, say, let's see what they come back with. And so uh, I think it surprised both of us that the groups came back with so much energy and enthusiasm and uh, were so complimentary um, and that we think we can uh, explore being better together. And so from there, you know, we, we launched the, uh, the negotiation actually, th these are complex organizations, went fairly, fairly quickly as these things go. Mm -hmm. And what it allowed us to do is then think about, okay, we've got the negotiation, let's think about the future. Let's start planning for day one. Let's like deliver on the promise of these organizations. And so fast forward, next month is actually 18 months together. Uh, we'll be breaking ground on a new medical school, the second school of Wake Forest in Charlotte, your hometown. Uh, we've just announced uh, an innovation quarter that will be part of, of uh, connected to the Winston um, IQ Center. And so, and uh, I had a chance to meet with our physician leaders uh, earlier, a couple hours ago, and just asked them, how's it going? And uh, I think if you were all a fly on the wall, you would be as energized as I was in terms of the, the radical collaboration. Because when you get physicians that are across you know, 90 miles, and now you said, okay, now we gotta figure out how to do heart programs together, or orthopedic, or neuroscience, uh, or plastics, or, uh, you, that, that requires radical collaboration, and, uh, and also fundamentally uh, healthy cultures. And I think that's really uh, part of why I'm so, so excited. But the, the other part of that, and talking about culture, because I know you focus so much on that, and that's really a, a leadership uh, responsibility. The, the thing that um, I think I, I respect that the, the work that's been done here and, and what I think I've been able to do also at Atrium is leadership is about establishing high trust relationships and that's a fundamental to radical collaboration. Uh, the challenge is when we've gone to grad school, there's not many uh, classes <laughs> that say, you know, leadership as a fundamental is the, how do you develop high trust relationships? Because it goes back to the Kobe thing, the speed of trust. You, you have to have that as a fundamental. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things I, um, I think is that this university does so well is, you know, there's a program on leadership and character. Mm -hmm. It almost should be required for, for everybody that, that intends to be a leader because I think that's the fundamental uh, 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 groundwork that, that any executive has to do and it's, it's based on how do you develop those high trust relationships and I and I will say that Dr. Wente, Dr. Freislag and myself we are just about finishing our sentences now and and that's the strength of that coll collaboration I think allows us to go mm -hmm. faster than really any medical school any learning organization in the country and we're just getting started. Okay fantastic thank you. Um, Gene, you talked about sending the team away. So it sounds like there was a high trust relationship with you and Dr. Freischlag. Yeah. And then send the teams away and see what they come back with, which was a way of getting the ideas out. So Larry, are you doing anything at GE? Because you've got you know, several different operating units. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you make sure as a leader, whatever organization you're in, how do the good ideas bubble up? Well, we try to make sure that in each of the businesses, we're really clear with each of our leadership teams as to where we're trying to take the business long term, right? Okay. That's not a top down direction from the head office. We're really looking for the CEO and their staffs to look out five to 10 years and where we want each of our three businesses, soon all of which will be independently listed companies, to be. How are we going to lead in precision healthcare? How are we going to lead in the future of flight? How are we going to lead through the energy transition? three incredible missions, by the way, which yeah. get us, I think, pretty excited on a daily basis. 
And when we're clear about where we're going, then we just work back. And what we try to do in our strategic discussions with the leadership teams is make sure that we're not in those silos, that engineering is going to do this and manufacturing is going to do that, right? And have everyone be in a position where they can independently declare victory while the collective may not have won. And that's where our Hoshin Connery tool comes in, where we really try to not only distill where we're going, but how do we get there? Right? I think a lot of leaders delegate the how because it's, it's boring. I think that's real, where you actually win or lose, right? right? But by forcing our teams to have that conversation, to talk about how they're going to get there, what they not surprisingly find is it isn't a series of functional efforts. Anything that's critical to long-term strategy by nature is going to be 95 times out of 100 cross-functional in nature. Okay, well, if that's the case and that's what we have to do, we're really going to have to collaborate to do this. And I was, I was in a meeting in Cincinnati just today, I'll give you a quick example, where the team was reflecting on the last three days of, of discussions. And sales leader in the business said, we've been talking about doing this for seven years. Now I think we're actually going to do it. So it wasn't necessarily a great insight, but it was a, a, a different way of going about the work to bring these teams together. Now it's one thing to say, now we're going to do it, right? Let's see where we are three months from now and six months from now. You know this, Gene, right? Right. But I'm highly optimistic we will be down that path in a way that maybe we haven't in the past. Okay. And if we can do that business by business by business, most days out of the week over time, with the cumulative effect of that. It's powerful. It's pretty powerful. It's powerful. So the process that um, you talk to, that you use with mm -hmm. the senior leadership and I'm sorry, say that again. Hoshin Conry. Hoshin Conry. Guiding Light. Guiding in Light. In Japanese. Okay. Not the television program. Does it, does it break? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> does, it, does it break down? Tell me, tell me a little bit more about this. I'm familiar with Kaizen, but this I'm not, so help where, us understand. Where are we going in GE right. Healthcare five years out? Right. Okay. Where are we going to go over the next 12 months? Okay. How do we get there? Right. So tactical, like well, breaks it down into what the how, must be The how true. to me is strategic, okay. right? Because everything else is just PowerPoint right. up until you change the how, yep. right? Yep. But if you get in there and again, around the really important breakthroughs where you far force that radical collaboration, that cross-functional work and have the teams declare up front how we're gonna keep score, mm. yep. the flywheel begins to turn. Right, and that's, that's the magic of Hoshin Connery. Because a lot, of, a lot of companies, I'm sure Atrium isn't this way, but a lot of companies will talk about where they're going in five years, and then everybody goes back to work. Right? right? <laughs> Other companies talk about one year objectives, and then everybody goes back to work. Right. What we try to do is create a, a regular dynamic where we're talking about the five year goals, the one year goals, but more importantly, how are we going to get there? And guess what? There are no straight lines. So we're banking off guardrails, mm -hmm. hitting potholes, rocks, but we're sorting through that mm -hmm. together, right? Whether we're winning, where we're losing, whether we're stymied, we go into extreme problem solving mode and work our way through it. And over time, we get down those paths. You get there. One of the, um, one of the greatest leaders that um, I had the pleasure to, to work in his organization, Greg Forian, um, who's, he's now the CEO of Kiwi Air, Airlines. He's a New mm -hmm. Zealander by birth, but he was the CEO of Walmart US. Right. Did something very similar. And you know we constantly had to check back in on, like, where are we on this? Where are we on this? Where are we on this? Yeah. And when the excuses started, why not? Why not? Why not, you know, until everyone figured out, well, this is where we're going and, and force that collaboration. Right. And he had the, um, frankly, the, the strength to take so many details in, right, and got down in the nitty gritty until, right. um, until you know, and I think Walmart, I'm an alumnus, I, I think was able to perform as well as they did during COVID because of right. some of the foundation that was laid, you know, in, in his tenure. We call that the five whys, right? right? It's a very powerful Why tool, Why not? Right. which we all learn as children, right? Why, <laughs> why, why, why? Right. But somehow yeah. we lose it. Right. But if you can get a team together 
Exactly. Just asking that question without trying to blame one person mm -hmm. or another, right? But just to get to root cause, to really understand an opportunity or challenge. And that, I think you may have found the same thing. During the pandemic, that five whys, getting the right people in the room allowed you to kind of get to the, 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 the action that needed to be taken uh, fairly quickly because we were making decisions on, you know, uh, in, in our moments, you know, and, and really that had big consequences. And that five why, we, I, I've used it too. Right. Or the, the way, a, a version of that, if this, then what? Is, right. is what it is. So I do that five times. If this, yeah. then what? It, and you kind of call it on the, on the fly scenario planning. Right. Uh, and if you have the right people in the room that cover the right sort of pieces of the organization, you can get to the it right. pretty quickly. Um, so it's a version of the five, it's a version of the five whys. Yeah. But you, ha you got to have the right people in the you room. You got to have the right people in the room. It all starts there, right? Right. And create the right environment, right? Because you, you've got to allow, and I know you do it too, is, you, John, you're not saying very much. How, how do you think about that? And, and creating that dynamic around the room so you're really getting people's ideas on the table and comfortable enough that some of the ideas might not be the right ones, but you're, right. you're going to kind of ferret through them. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, I've also heard it called the what, uh, what must be true, right? For us to achieve this, right. what must be true, which yeah. you know, can help take some of the finger pointing out. But right. um, so it sounds like, uh, I like to call it getting the skunk on the table is pretty, is pretty important, you know, get the truth telling and set up the framework, you know, for the details for success. So um, I, I feel pretty inspired about, about radical collaboration now. Do you, do you think coming out of COVID and what you know, leaders and individual you know, folks, what we've all been through in the last few weeks, or a few years, two years now, is, it, is that going to help catapult some, some collaboration or is everyone too exhausted to, to deal with radical collaboration? What do you think about just the kind of the mood that, that we're in now? My sense is it, we're, we've leapfrogged and, and if, if I think about what we had to do radical collaboration to get through the pandemic and we're still kind of in it obviously. Uh, I think about in the middle, once the vaccines, once we got the vaccines, um, we had a huge distribution issue in this country, right? A supply and distribution issue. And, um, you know, I had a, a walk with the CEO of Honeywell, Darius, uh, and he said, what's the problem? How come you can't, this is a logistics issue. Uh, and I said, well, it is. So, uh, so we, we had that conversation. Then we invited the, uh, the head of the Panthers, uh, and then we talked to uh, Marcus at uh, Charlotte Motor Speedway, and let's say, what would it take for us to do this mass vaccination event right. And so we had the healthcare component, we have Honeywell with all the logistical uh, components, and then we had you know, uh, uh, Panthers and uh, the Motor Speedway folks that know how to manage large crowds, right? We put that together and we held uh, some of the most successful mass vaccination events in the entire country. Mm -hmm. Our guiding principle was you would see it on television, mothers and fathers and grandmothers waiting in four hour lines and if you did the math, we actually had a shot in arms every 4.5 seconds. Wow. And in one weekend, we had 30,000 people through Bank of America Stadium. Interesting, I was at, at um, uh, lunch the other day, and uh, this happened a, you know, a little while ago, and uh, some, unbeknownst to me, this woman comes to me and says, thank you, I took my mother through the motor speedway, and then we, we designed it for experience, so you got to drive around the motor speedway before you go in, and then you got to the pit stop, and then that's where we did the shot, and, we, and, and it's like, so let's make an experience, and the same thing, in Panther Stadium, you got to take your picture and, and things of that nature, so they walked away, People were in tears, um, but it's a, it's an example of radical collaboration. So now, you know, uh, Darius and I, very close friends, um, working, you know, very close with Charlotte Motor Speedway and Panthers, and we're exploring what else, what else can we do? So, um, because I think right now we're dealing with a lot of complex issues in society, and the only way, the only way, I think that's part of the theme that they get solved, is if Larry works with me, works with the elected officials, uh, works with community grassroots group, that is really, no, business can't solve it by themselves, uh, government can't solve it by themselves, and unless we orient ourselves around that, I think, you know, um, 
the, the promise of being a more perfect union, especially these days, I think, we, 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 uh, we risk some of that. So I think this is a moment in time that we take the lessons of the pandemic that, and all of the collaboration. I mean, the vaccine, that was radical collaboration of scientists throughout the world, working with NIH, working with businesses and things of that nature. So uh, I think it's a shame on us mo moment if we don't take that and everything we've learned that has really uh, allowed us to go faster and carry it forth uh, post-pandemic into solving some of the issues that we all have to deal with fundamentally in society. As you were asking that question, you said the last several weeks and then you went to years, years to yeah. tee up COVID. But let's talk about the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Sadly, we just lost a former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, someone who preceded us on this stage. Yep. And Colin Powell. Okay. Too, just a few it, months ago, exactly. he was here with her. Yeah. And I think if they were both here, they would be talking about radical collaboration mm -hmm. in the face of tyranny, yep. right? What, what has happened in Ukraine, what has happened throughout the West over the last month is nothing short of remarkable, mm -hmm. right? And they both spoke about the power of alliances and friends and partnerships, shared values and being together when it matters most. And I think that's what's happening now, unfortunately, in the face of, of this, this violence. I think that also will set a tone, not only within companies and right. other organizations, but I think broadly. Mm -hmm. Well, and it, it you know brings to mind the the discussion of I probably you know won't put this exactly well, but that you know no one institution can s solve it all, right? And so COVID was I heard it I heard it referred to one time as the only threat that humankind has basically experienced the whole globe all at once, you know, all at the same time. And with the Ukraine, things that are going on, it's the never, um, never coming out of it. So, um, so great points about, about the, um, about the time now for the, for the radical collaboration. Really great points. Let me do a quick time check. I am going to, I'm going to switch and I'm going to indulge, um, an area of, because uh, we have time to do this, area of fascination for me personally. And it's about, you know, you were, you're energized about something. It could be about radical collaboration, something at work. Um, maybe it's a career switch. And it's about failure, that <laughs> big scary failure word. Um, Brene Brown does a lot of work in this area, and in, in the area of, of shame is, is hers, but failure, right? And I think it's a myth that wildly successful people, as, such as you, you know, really haven't dealt with failure in the past. I think so because a myth. I, I bet <laughs> right a myth exactly. I bet that you know you've each had you know we all have had failures large and small. So when I talk to student groups or or people who are you know younger in their careers, one of the thing, one of the little you know pieces of advice I give is. Um, it's to have a plan for failure, right? The, the little kind of failure where, you know, you flub something and maybe it involves chocolate and a call to a girlfriend, all right? And then there's the big massive failures that, you know, you can have in your career and it can get in the media, right? So my philosophy is if you have a plan to deal with it, you recover quicker, you have more resiliency. Mm -hmm. So feel free to disagree, agree, but tell me, I mean, do you have any techniques for dealing with failure? You're in roles even that maybe it's not failure, but you just get constant criticism, right? You know, based on, because- <laughs> You want me to go first? Yeah. Right? So, He's never failed, so he wants me to take the balance of the time to, to have this sure. conversation. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, tell us the stories it, of how, how have you dealt with some... It's, it's interesting. I was having this conversation. I said that my first class was philosophy, and actually I, I love it. And, and for some, I was describing this to a friend who actually had a failure, uh, and, and I was telling this, this quick parable that, I, that stuck with me, and you, some of you may have heard it, of a, of a rural farmer, and, you know, he had a horse and the horse ran away and then his neighbor comes and says oh that's such bad luck your horse ran away horse comes back the next day with three wild horses the neighbor says wow that's incredible look at your good fortune you got now four horses uh, the and the and the, and the, um, the farmer says well maybe um, then his, his son 
rides one of these wild horses, falls off, the neighbor comes back and says, oh, that's horrible, your son fell off, and that's such that's a bad luck. He says, well, oh, maybe. The, the, uh, the military comes through for the draft and then see that his son is, is, has a broken leg and pass him by. And so it's a series of maybes to say, keep an even keel. I think the one thing, you can't get too high, you can't get too low, and you really, um, you know, the, we talk about a, being a learning organization. Uh, Edison failed 10,000 times before doing the light bulb. Uh, you reframe, I, th I think I try to reframe a setback as just part of the learning journey. And if you have that orientation and don't stop and persevere, I think that's, that's how, uh, because you know, organizations, when you're trying to do big things, as, as you've just described too, you, you're not gonna hit the mark all the time. And then if you fail to learn from that, that's when, that's the true failure. Right. And so that's sort of the reframing, I think, that, that uh, at least I try to, to internalize and also express more uh, throughout the organization. Okay. And I, and I think it's important for leaders to create that environment. I, when, I, when I came to GE, there was a, an urban legend that, that bad news didn't travel up the organization. So I would actually go hunt bad news to create opportunities. Didn't, it wasn't hard. Um, <laughs> but to create opportunities, right, to have the honest conversation. And I, I remember one session where we had just won a, a big order, good news, had gotten off to a really rocky start. And I don't think anyone wanted to talk about that. I heard about it, I had an opportunity to say, how'd the kickoff go? Room went silent, everyone was looking around. And the individual who uh, spoke up said that it had gone very poorly. And you could tell that a number of people liked this guy but knew they'd never see him again, <laughs> right? And we got to play the five wise, mm -hmm. right? And we had a really good, active problem solving yeah. session. All I did was ask questions, but I think more importantly, show everybody we could have that conversation as long as we learned from it, mm -hmm. right? And to Gene's point, we're better next time through. But I also remember when I took this job, you were asking that question. Uh, I walked out of a class I was teaching, uh, a, a class ironically on leadership, and I had an opportunity. I walked out on a Friday. I knew I wouldn't be back. I took this job on a Monday, had a chance to go back at lunch to say goodbye to the class. And it was, it was really quite emotional. And we had a little Q&A at the end, and one student put his hand up and said, what happens if you fail? Which was a typical MBA student question, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you, you had this earlier career, you had mm -hmm. uh, some success, why would you risk it? And I paused because I had never thought about that. Right. Right, I just, I thought it was a great opportunity. What did I know? Uh, but as I put together an answer, I channeled my friend Brian Rogers, the former uh, chairman at T. Rowe Price, who was fond of saying the world doesn't end very often, right? Exactly. Despite forecast to the contrary. <laughs> so I, I, I told the student, if I fail, I think my family will still love me. I think my reputation will be fundamentally intact. Mm -hmm. And I will walk out with my head held high for having done my best. Right. I don't know what he was expecting, but it turned out perhaps to be the best lesson of the whole class, mm. right? So again, I think particularly when we're young in life, young in our careers, we have to take chances. And Gene hit on this earlier, recognizing that we're gonna fail and it's rarely fatal. Right, I love that. I um, spent a career in retail merchandising, so um, buyers were people people that I worked with, people who make this glass appear somewhere, you know, in a store. And um, in in uh, Walmart, there's a rule that you have two level reviews. So when we did a, a buyer review, their like director may be there, and then I was a like senior VP or EVP. And my favorite question, and I could only do it for a while because then the word got out, but I would always ask the buyer, I wanna know what your biggest flop this year was. And to try to diffuse the situation, I'd say, you know, like the thing you bought that we're gonna tease you about at your retirement party. I mean, come <laughs> on, you know, tell me. And I've got some hilarious examples later. But um, 
I, I, I st after you know a little while of doing that, I noticed a correlation that the the buyers who c come up with these, I mean, disasters, disasters of products were actually the best buyers, right? They made their numbers, the suppliers liked working with them because they were taking enough risk to find the next great item knowing that, you know, their ratio could be 100% and it was the buyers who, eh, you know, they well, I didn't really have a big flop this year and they really didn't if you look at the item but everything just sort of poked along, right? They, they didn't have the greatest comps, right? So, so taking risk matters, so. Let's see, we're doing really well on time. Um, let's see. What about uh, this? Is this is a this is a fun question too? What is a question? Now we've gotten to do your leadership styles, right? I know you have some great stories. Is there a question that you always wonder why people don't ask, interviewers don't ask it? This is the, I usually ask this at the end of an interview, like when I'm interviewing someone for a, for a job, I'll say, what question do you really wish that I'd ask you because there's something that you want to bring out for our, our audience? It's a wild card, it's a wild card. <laughs> interviewers, as in interviewers in the media? Sure. Okay. I mean, that's yeah. what, that, what comes to in, mind. In any sense, but yeah. yeah. Well, whether we're doing media or whether we're with investors and other kind of third parties, the, question is, the questions are often about how much. And, and frequently are we asked about the how, uh. right? We've talked a lot about our process mm -hmm. and how we're trying to transform GE. That's the under asked question. And ironically, at least certain members of the media and certain investors have an eye and an ear for it. Got it. But it's, it's, it, 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 it rarely comes up. Because again, in this world today, it is often just about the numbers, but I think the smart money is focused on how those numbers are delivered, both with an eye towards sustainability, mm -hmm. right, but also the, uh, you know, just the, un the underlying endearing capabilities. Right, so asking the, asking the next smart question instead of filling in the cell in the Excel sheet. Yeah. Right? Uh, okay. okay. Uh, uh, maybe I'll take a little different angle. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a group of uh, CEO colleagues that uh, we have a conversation every uh, four to six weeks and just to kind of share. And one of the questions that we have asked each other uh, recently in uh, different stages of their careers is, uh, uh, when do you know when it's going to be time to retire mm. and what are you going to do in retirement? Um, and it was the conversation we asked, uh, we had not too long ago, and uh, one of, uh, I have another friend that, that just retired and thought that what he was looking forward to is playing golf for the rest of his life, and after six months, he's now looking for another a job because that's not what he, <laughs> he realized that's not the end all be all. I have another one who is actually contemplating retirement. And he says, you know, he's lost a little bit of the fire in the belly to mm -hmm. tackle what's going to be important for the next 10 years. So he's looking to retire. Uh, and he knows because of that, that's why he's thinking I need to, re to retire and sell the company. But he's looking at, he's got 20 orphanages that he's built throughout the world. Wow. That, including one in Roma Romania that uh, he's accepting. Um, uh, this is as a side gig to his, to his mm. job. So he's, he's willing, because sometimes people stay on too long, and, and he's excited about this next chapter because he knows in addition to writing cycles in 10 different countries that he's got mapped out already, he's gonna be able to fill his bucket in a different way through, through, through these orphanages. And I think it just kind of got me thinking, hopefully, you know, if I look 10 years out or, or 12 years out, um, it's an important question that leaders of, of, of complex organizations should be asking because sometimes stay too long. And, and, and I think, and part of that is not knowing what the next phase of life is. And so it was just an interesting conversation. You typically don't see that asked of leaders directly or publicly, but it, it was a nice forum to have that, that discussion. Right, yeah. right. So. I just thought of the, this correlation. There's knowing knowing when to um, change it, step out of one career into another's retirement, whatever it is. Like how to know when to leave, mm -hmm. 
how do you know when the great collaboration you're trying to get done, like at what point, maybe it's trust your gut, right? Back to what you said earlier, but at what point you need to go, let's part as friends, this, this might not work. And how do you preserve a relationship built on trust going forward? Because not every one of you know, the great radical collaboration ideas will make it, right? So, so what do you do when it does it? Different type of failure question. How do you know and what do you do? How do you handle it gracefully? You know, I think it does come down to the, uh, when the culture ultimately is, is not congruent, then that's the time to, to part. And sometimes you don't know that until you're actually engaged in the work. Right, because mm -hmm. a lot of times when you're coming together, an organization or, or we're different, trying to do something, um, everybody's enthusiastic at the front end. But if ultimately, if you realize that your value set, your, your mm -hmm. cultures, what you care about is, is different, that's almost at some point irreconcilable, right? Yep. And so I think uh, you, you can't ever quit too early in that regard. But when you mm -hmm. realize that, then I think that's, to me at least, that's been that's been part of where you say, you know, we've tried, but Great. it's not going to work. Yeah. I, agree. I, I just think it's important, particularly if you're talking about collaborations outside of any one ent enterprise, to be clear up front, what are the objectives? How are we going to measure success? And let's both be mindful. We may share values, we may share a vision, but a lot of collaborations don't succeed. Right. So let's, let's go in eyes wide open. It doesn't mean we both have one eye on the door, but this may not work, and if it doesn't, that's not necessarily a failure, it's just maybe the, the termination of, of this one effort. And I think if you get that right up front, not always easy, but if you right. get it right up front, it's a lot easier if that collaboration, that joint venture, what have you, doesn't pan out. So I think acknowledging that possibility up front, maybe that mm -hmm. soft plan for, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that it might not work out and having that discussion. Right. Really good, really good. Well, um, gentlemen, you've, you're both, um, uniquely positioned, I think, to, um, to provide uh, some guidance for Dr. Winty. This is a, a big week, big week for her. And um, you, all three of you are your, basically your fellow CEOs of incredibly complex organizations. So what I'd like to do um, tonight is get ready to close this out um, with some advice. So um, teeing you up, Gene, oh. you're a uh, you're a direct business partner, right, with uh, with Dr. Winty, and you, and you're both at the forefront of a very unique collaboration. So, as a colleague and as a friend, what advice do you offer Wake Forest's 14th? And I'm glad you said colleague as a friend because we've quickly become friends. Um, I, I would say uh, a few things. One is she had, she toured me around uh, uh, some months ago, and. Uh, she, she, at every time, I think it was four or five students, she stopped, she's touring me, she stopped, she's engaging with them, you know, uh, how's it going, are you having any issues? Uh, oh yeah, maybe you should check with that. She was doing that, and I actually saw her backstage doing the same thing, and she lights up uh, when she does that, continue to do that. I mean, that's, that's part of her secret uh, sauce there. Um, we've had the opportunity to talk about her vision for this university and taking it really to the next level. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a compelling vision. I know she's still flushing out, um, but she also has the power as the CEO of this organization to continue to convene the, the different constituencies that, that are here and nationally uh, and roll in her incredible compelling vision and saying this is help us, radical collaboration is a fundamental, help us continue to evolve what this great uh, organization will continue to be. Um, I would also say that uh, she is a role model to women leaders uh, and, and the next generation. And uh, she is also, I've come to know, a very humble person, but continuing to tell her story because it's, a, it's, it's an important story for, for this next generation of women to understand that they can, they can um, uh, achieve her heights. And the final one we were talking just before uh, backstage is, take some time for herself every once in a while because uh, we need her for the for the long haul and and so <laughs> try to try to take a little bit of personal time every now and again i'm sure her husband would would concur as well <laughs> <laughs> 
Absolutely, we were we were talking on the on the phone last week, and there's that analogy that um, that I've heard. You know, when you're on an airplane and the they say, oh, if the masks come down, which has actually happened to me. But anyway, another story. But when the masks come down, um, you know, be sure to put it on yourself first yeah. before you help the person next to you who may need help. Yeah. And that's because you need to be in a position to help others. So take, take good care of yourself, Susan. Okay, fantastic. Now, um, Larry, all three children chose Wake Forest and you give of your time as a trustee. Thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Winty shared with us at the last trustee meeting, you, you, were, you were quoted um, that you advised her as she was taking the role to take the first year to have, to take a long, deep soak in Wake Forest. You've, you're being quoted a lot on that now. It's just, it's a lovely phrase. And I know she's listened because Dr. Winty seems to be everywhere. I mean, she is all the games, all, you know, with the students on the, on the quad. Um, but that, that year is coming up quickly, like believe it or not. So, you know, based on uh, what you've learned from your children's experience here is here at Wake Forest on the trustees, like what would you add on to that advice tonight? Well, I, I probably would just uh, endorse Jean's advice as a, as a parent, uh, let alone as a CEO. Uh, I, I think about what Jean just said and what my friend Jim Collins mm. refers to as preserve the core yeah. and stimulate progress. If you've read, I think, Good to Great, you've, Good to you've great. seen that. I mean, as a parent, right, and again, N equals three, well, two and three quarters, we still have one more year to go. Um, <laughs> What Gene described, I think, is the magic at Wake Forest. Uh, whether it's in a classics classroom, whether it's on the baseball field, I've just always been so struck by how student-centric this wonderful school is. Uh, and to me, that's the core that I would suggest that we, we preserve. Uh, stimulate progress is all about after that soak, right? What are the two or three things when we look back in 10 years? right at the next inauguration, will we look back on as the hallmarks of, of her tenure? And having a view as to what that might be, not today, but mm -hmm. soon, right? And then keeping us all in line over time. Again, it won't be a straight line, but over time, right? We build on what's an exceptional institution. Exactly, and keeping our eyes on the opportunities for radical collaboration yeah. and um, I'll, I'll throw one in, um, Susan, I, uh, I received a thank you note from you, wonderful, very personal thank you note from you, uh, I believe it was last week or the week before, and um, that will be framed and go next to a handwritten thank you note I have from uh, Dr. Hearn, Thomas Hearn, who was the president uh, here, and I've had his little framed thank you mm -hmm. note over my desk for a really long time, and I think you know, that's just my example of the impact that, you know, one person, a university president can have on, on one student. Yeah. So um, I'm just incredibly honored to be able to have had this conversation with you um, here in a place with so many special memories for me. And um, thank you for your wisdom and your insight and your time tonight. Everyone, can we please appreciate our wonderful guest? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. That's it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was great. That was great. Thank you. Mr. Culp, Mr. Woods, and Ms. Hayes, thank you for the truly remarkable discussion. And we want to thank everybody in attendance tonight for joining us to celebrate our 14th president of Wake Forest University, Dr. Wente. Face-to-face welcome, Sanjay Gupta, noted surgeon, multiple Emmy Award winner on April 12th. The event will be here, be here right here. So we hope you'll join us as we unveil our season two next. Um, and again, thank you again for joining us and enjoy your evening.